Tonight we're here to celebrate the age of you. I want to first thank all of you for being here and everyone who supports MOCA. It is with your support that we can initiate and produce complex, engaging projects such as this that ask urgent, timely questions and really inspire conversation. For the age of you, I'd specifically like to thank our lead supporter, Lindy Green Family Foundation, our foundational supporter, the Schulich Foundation, uh, we'd also like to thank the Japan Foundation for their support of Satoshi Fujiwara, who I think is here tonight, hopefully with us somewhere. Um, and our future collaboration with the Jamil Art Centre in Dubai, where this show will be recomposed and presented in the autumn of 2020. I'd also love to thank the curators, the designer, the contributors, uh, who the other contribu contributors here tonight are Anieszka Karant, uh, Miles Gertler, Victoria Sin, and I think Sarah Sweena might be here as well. Um, and the many other people who worked on this incredible collaboration, including the team at MOCA. It has already touched the lives of hundreds of people already. Many of you are aware that unfortunately, Hans Ulrike Brees could not join us in Toronto. We received the sad news last week that his mother passed away. And we think of him today as they held a memorial in her memory in Zurich. But tonight on stage we have the curators of the project, Shimon Bossar, Douglas Copeland, and participating artist Victoria Sin. Um, and I just want to start by expressing how this project emerged. So essentially, I think almost three years ago now, I received a copy of The Age of Earthquakes, which is the prequel to the project we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and I have known Shimon for many years, and I was I read this book. It takes about 20 to 40 minutes to read. And it, it just energized me so much, and I found it so compelling. But I really was inspired to think how it would be to walk through this project, to experience the works in different ways, given that there were many artists contributors to that, to that book as well. So actually, when I was invited for an interview at Mocha Toronto, I was like, I should pitch this idea. So I phoned Shimon and said, what do you think about doing an exhibition based on the book? And he said, well, you know, I have to speak to Doug and I have to speak to Hans, intrigued. Um, got back to me pretty rapidly, I think, and said, you know what? We'd love to do something, but actually we'd like to do a new book and we'll do an exhibition. So maybe that got me the opportunity to work here because <laughs> I pitched it at the interview. And then I came and we started working on it. So we've been talking about this project for about two and a half years. Um, and it's really been an incredible journey. So I think you know, we should start there in thinking about um, the age of earthquakes, which was inspired or conceived as a kind of reference to Marshall McLuhan and Toronto being a spiritual home. I think it's relevant to ask first, you know, what is the extreme present? And why is Marshall McLuhan more relevant than ever now? Thank you so much, November. Uh, thank you all for coming here this evening. Uh, thanks to all our amazing uh, contributors, uh, the team that installed the exhibition. It's really been uh, a kind of uh, impeccable, wonderful, I mean, yeah. you know, e e experience, and we're really looking forward to these next few days. So, yeah, maybe as a little bit of context before we talk about the age of you, um, which is the subtitle to our forthcoming book, whose title is the Extreme Self. Um, we should, in a sense, talk about the prequel a little yeah. bit, which is The Age of Earthquakes. And the subtitle to that book was A Guide to the Extreme Present. So maybe, yeah. Doug, um, it, it started with Doug actually writing a, a biography on Marshall McLuhan back in 2010. So maybe, Doug, you could talk about that and then how that got, to a, got yeah. us to The Age of Earthquakes. Thank you. Uh, uh, X number of years back, I was dragged, to be honest, kicking and screaming into writing a short biography of Marshall McLuhan, who I really had no idea who he was or what he did. There was a deadline, it was part of the series, I finished the book, and now I wish I could go back in and completely redo it, now that I think I know who Marshall McLuhan really, really was, for real. Um, and, The thing about Marshall McLuhan is he really saw what was coming down the road. He just got the interfaces wrong. I mean, something as simple as online shopping was like a TV with a woman holding up a shirt, and you buy it or you don't. But uh, 
There was a show at UTAC uh, about eight years ago uh, called uh, the Bordello Without Walls. And that was how McLuhan saw the deluge of pornography that was to come on the culture, that that's how it would express itself or be made into a metaphor, I think. Uh, and then now as time goes on, I realize he was right about everything. And if he's right about everything to now, he's probably going to continue on being right into the future. So then I met you at Hans Ulrich, and we were in Dubai, Dubai. at the Global Art Forum. And it, we just went up to this restaurant, and we talked for about six hours, I think. And we talked about McLuhan, and we talked a little bit about uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who someone will talk about sh shortly. But I think the three of us sensed something was really in the air at the time, and something continues to be in the air. And that we had just almost like, like, like barf it out of us or something. And, and the things that once took a lot of like, debate and things that took like, a lot of disclaimers, like, I miss my pre internet brain, like, they're like, that's not possible. Brains can't. Now we all completely know it. And uh, the first book we did as an expression of this was called The Age of Earthquakes. And it refers to the fact that. Uh, 25 years ago, 0% of the global energy economy went into the internet and information. Uh, X number of years later, it became 3%, and it's only going to grow and grow. And then you look at climate change, and you look at the energy that is used to uh, keep the internet going. And in a genuine geological manner, you can say that you're melting the ice caps, the water's going towards the equator, you've got this thing called isostatic uh, 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 isostasis, and all of the fault lines on the planet are having a massage suddenly, and it boom, and then if you look at the numbers, there have been a significant number uh, more of earthquakes in the last 15 years than in recorded history, which may just be the fact that we're now recording earthquakes more. But it was, oh my God, we changed inside of our brain. We changed the planet. That was really scary. And so that's when the start of that book, which became this book. Apparently. Yeah, and, and so we coined this neologism called uh, the extreme present. And perhaps the easiest way to describe the extreme present is the result of two simultaneous forces. So on the one hand, uh, in the past, the future used to be something distant that we were always heading towards, but in a sense never arrived at. But we are now living in the future, clearly. I think every morning we wake up, and there are at least half a dozen scientific, technological, astronomical uh, achievements that would have been science fiction. Well, the future is now the present tense. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so we're, we're inhabiting the future, and the past is, is we, we don't have to remember the past because we upload it to the cloud. So these sort of simultaneous forces then leave us with this sliver, you could say, of the, uh, of the extreme present. And, and here perhaps it's worth mentioning an interesting uh, neurological nugget, which is that according to neurologists, so this, the neurology of the brain is, is uh, the neurology of time in the brain is still very nascent. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not really understood compared to, for example, how our brains process space. So you could point to particular points in the, in the brain and say, that's where spatial understanding happens, that's where your motor fa faculties happen. You can't do that with time. There are, there are spurious theories about what time is in the brain, neurologically. But the one thing that neurologists by and large agree with is our, uh, uh, the brain's measurement of the present is somewhere between 2 and 2.5 seconds. So every, anything on either side of that is the past and the future. And then we realized one day that, you know, if you're on, your, if you're on a social media feed and then you drag the top to refresh the feed, it's about, it's about the same unit of time. So in a sense that you could, we could say that the extreme present is, is that unit where we're, we're, we're waiting for the next frame of the present to be, um, to be refreshed. And, and this, this, is, this is what we mean by the extreme present. And so that whole book, in a sense, was a, a kind of history of the world, 
uh, as our brains have been rewired and as the planet also had been rewired and restructured by this new kind of prof profound uh, sense of time and atomization. Well, I mean, a very, you can get medical about this again. Uh, I've been very lucky over the years to meet Norman Doidge, who's a Toronto based writer who writes about the brain. Mm. And one, the, if you look back at a thousand years from now, like where were your ancestors in the year 1019? Uh, probably living in a mud hut or wherever. And there was no future tense. There was no word for the future. Uh, there's, there's no sense of personal space. There was just this eternal present, which in some way we've come back to. But that, back then you would get maybe one and a half dopamine hits a day, like maybe like a snake attacks you or you find some strawberries and it's great or something. And then now, you know, every day, probably everyone in this room gets probably more than a thousand dopamine hits a day, whether it's opening an email or clicking this or whatever. And in the registration of time that way, we've actually destroyed, we still experience time in real time. I mean, you're here, I'm here, we're all talking. But at the end of the year, time no longer feels like time. That year feels like 10 minutes. And you go through your iPhone photos and like, man, I did a lot of things in the last 12 months, but it feels like, like I want my time back. Where did time go? I missed time. Like, where, what happened? So, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how the Age of Earthquakes as a book is structured in terms of time. Um, and in reference to the medium is the muscle. Well, this is, it's, so those, some of you may know this famous book. Um, you know, it's credited to Marshall McLuhan, but in fact it was a collaboration um, with uh, Jerome Agel, who was uh, a self-professed book producer based in New York and a graphic designer called Quentin Fiore, who at that point was most famous for doing the typography of the numbers on the bell, the famous bell telephone that was handset. Fun. Yeah. And um, they, well, they decided in around 1966 to take uh, McLuhan's ideas, which at that point had been published in a number of very um, dense academic books, um, and they set themselves the brief of making Marsha McLuhan uh, comprehensible to a 10-year-old girl, which is a fantastic brief, right? And they approached uh, Professor McLuhan here in Toronto and asked him if they could do it, and he said, why not go for it? They went away for six months and they came back with, uh, in a sense, a, a brand new kind of format of a book. Um, so The Medium is the Massage is a, a paperback, a black and white paperback, but that moves at, this, at kind of the speed of a hurtling you know, train. Um, but it's a book that's absorbed magazines, radio, television, advertising, but also the beginning of, uh, of electronic communication. And actually Quentin Fiore imagined it as a hybrid between a book and, and the computer, which is uh, incredible already in 1967. I mean, also it draws on Wyndham Lewis and Blast and that graphic tradition. But the thing, and anyone here who's watched the series Mad Men to completion, or was actually there, is that dum da dum you had the 50s and the early 60s, and suddenly you had these things called hippies. And like, what the hell? Who, who are these people? Like, how could they, where do they come from? And the only plausible answer was TV. And they were the first cohort of people that were raised with network television. And, uh, and then we come up decades later and we've got, I mean, I don't think it's as striking, but like these things called millennials, like, what are they? Or what's gonna happen to them? It's maybe not as extreme as hippies, but we're all realizing that we're all becoming different in our heads. We all know it, and it's hard, you can't deny it. And so you've got people who are maybe on one side, like I wanna hang on to what I was as much as possible. Then there's people like me, or a lot of young people is like, fuck it, I just wanna become whatever it is we're becoming as quickly as possible, get me there now. And I think that's like the new polarization in society. And so the, the format of uh, The Age of Earthquakes updates McLuhan, the medium is the massage, but to the 21st century. And it's a book that is designed not only for eyes, but for fingers, for fingers that swipe, because that's the speed. We basically consume the world at the speed of the scroll. So it's a book that moves at the speed of the scroll, but 
a challenge that we wanted to set ourselves was can we do that but without necessarily sacrificing depth, uh, nuance, uh, and kind of difficult ideas. The images from that book come from 35 different contemporary artists, uh, and it's really important for us that that range of artists um, uh, span from what we call the 89 plus generation, people born in and around 1989, just after the Berlin Wall fell, came down, um, right up to much older conceptualists in their 70s and even in their 80s. And so that's a model that um, we've now um, continued um, in this new project, the, the Age, Age of You. But the Age of Earthquakes came out in 2015. 2015. Um, so then 2016, then 2016 happened. 2016 happened. So Doug, what happened in 2016? <laughs> I think it all just kicked in. Um, you know, there's a line, it's, it's on one of the panels, it's in the book, that ideology does not necessarily keep pace with technology. And in fact, usually there's a huge lag time between when a technology is invented and when it, we know how to handle it properly. I mean, look at the mess with Facebook. And uh, there's this wonderful documentary on Netflix now called The Great Hack. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. You probably could have written the first 20 minutes, but that, the 21st minute, it's like, oh my God, that happened. And I think what happened is we had this new technology that began with Google. Oh, we love Google, Facebook, yay, friends. And it just went dark. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, aliens did not come down and create this alienating technology. Human beings made it. And it can only ever be an expression of our humanity. And I think it just took about 20 something years for our ugliness to emerge. And now it's come out and now it's like, you can't deny it. And there's a perpetual record in the cloud forever. And and part of the crisis of polarization is like a crisis of, like, oh God, what are we as a species? I mean, we're, we like to think like, yay, we're the 90s friends and all that. We're not, we're a mess and yeah. And that, so I think one thing that happens in 2016 is that, um, you know, if we were to, if we were to follow through the analogy that data is the new oil, um, then 2016 was like a planetary oil spill. And one that we can't, in a sense, rewind, right? right? So, but in this, um, uh, I mean, there's a wonderful book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, which I really recommend. She spent 20 years on it. And, um, you know, if, if you know uh, uh, Piketty's book on capital, it's, it's sort of, I mean, you could say it's Marx's, I mean, it's capital, but for the 21st century. And she, sa she says, well, the building blocks, I mean, the Industrial Revolution produced its form of capitalism, right? And that data is now producing its form of capitalism. But who and uh, but what is the resource in that? The resource is every one of us. So in fossil capitalism, we would go out, or we would go out, we would drill, drill the ground, um, build an oil rig, um, et cetera, et cetera. We would, we would frack the earth to ultimately, and often, you know, exploit bodies to extract resources to build economies of wealth. Now, we frack, we frack ourselves, right? And this is a really, this is the profound shift that actually is the beginning of this project for us. And that's the big, and, and so, if we then become the most valuable resource in the world, uh, this truly is the age of you, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I approached you, I guess, it was towards the end of 2016. Yeah. So I think it was like that perfect catalyst, catalytic moment of realizing that probably the age of earthquakes needed to have a sequel. And I know that you then, after McLuhan, you started thinking about talking about Hobsbawm. So maybe we can discuss how his work, and I know he, he was very influential in Hans Ulrich's oh. life as well. Well, Eric Hobsbawm, he was the editor of it, Marxism Today for a long, long time. And he wrote this book called The Age of Extremes, what, 1994. And it looked at the 20th century as a short century that began with World War I and ended with the fall of the wall. And it's one of my favorite books of all time. And then, like, you're like, it's my favorite book of all time. And then with Hans Ulrich, it was like, it's like, okay, you got to do something with this. 
and we've done Age of Earthquakes, and then you look at Eric Hausbaum's view of the 20th century, which he divided into religion, technology, all those categories, and went through them one by one. Well, actually, what are these new categories that, what makes the 21st century completely different from the 20th? And that became sort of the, the skeleton which everything sort of began to be built on. Is that what we're, yeah? Absolutely. And I mean, there's a, you'll, if you go and have a look upstairs, um, one of the pages says, the age of you is the new age of extremes. And so, you know, Eric Hobson, I mean, he was a great historian. He was also a great stylist mm -hmm. and, a, and a great title. He wrote, wrote great titles. Yeah. Uh, he's perhaps most famous for his trilogy on the long 19th century, which includes the age of capital, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, and, and so he, he had written this long... He, he was really a, a historian of the, ninth, of the uh, 18th and 19th century. Um, but then when the Soviet empire ended, he decided to write this, uh, the history of the 20th century. But his own life um, mirrors this. And, and I think what's really beautiful and something that we extracted from this book is that in a way, the history of the 20th century could be told as a, a, a kind of almighty battle between the ideologies that fetishize the individual versus the ideologies that fetishize the crowd. Yeah. And, and so that became the starting point for, our, for the new book, for the extreme self. And so one of the, great que one of the questions that recurs throughout our, our new project is what matters more, the individual or the crowd? But given that both of these things are already morphing into something else, both for which we don't necessarily have names yet, um, uh, where is that going to take us? I think so. I mean, wh one of the questions we keep asking is, what's the opposite of you? And about 20 years ago, a friend of mine was on mat leave and she asked me to fill in for her at a course at Emily Carr in Vancouver. And as a four fourth year course, I thought there'd be some like spunk in the audience. And, um, and the first question I got was like, will we be graded on attendance? And this, oh. <laughs> And I'm not a good teacher and I don't enjoy it, which is a terrible combination, but it makes me appreciate good teachers. And uh, one of the projects was, okay, take two sheets of eight and up 11 paper, fold them into quadrants, staple them, trim the edges, and now I want you all to just take pens or pencils and I want you to make a little magazine called The Opposite of You, the magazine. And so it was very interesting to see what people considered as their opposite. Like, you know, some of them didn't change their gender, uh, for some people, it's entirely politics. Some people said from planet Earth and not from planet Earth. Uh, and after that, their only remaining creativity went into their excuses for not finishing their assignments. But that sort of, for me, is the rupture point. Well, what is the opposite of me or you? And how does that work? And, you know, we had this 19th century, 20th century notion of, like, the individual is, like, Dun, 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 out there having this, and now, you know, we're, we're at, and I don't want to get depressing here, but you now are very hyper aware that you're one unit amongst seven and a half billion other units. So you can have an age, a life that is singular, you know, whether it's heroic, I don't know. I'm talking too much here. No, that's all. Okay. No, but I, I think, well, you know, hopefully you'll see as you, you walk through the show that a lot of the, a lot of the, the things that perhaps we have come to, um, consider as certainties about the self uh, are being completely kind of reversed and inverted now. So, you know, if you think about Freud and the discovery of the unconscious, you know, as though there's a, there's a kind of secret true version of you locked up well, inside of you. Okay, two thoughts come to mind. Number one is they talk about the discovery of the subconscious like it was the discovery of Antarctica or something, that it was like this real place that it is, it's, it's really expensive to get to. And even you get there, you might not find any like secrets once you're there. The other thing with Freudianism, um, 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 oh God, and it was a very good point. Hang on. <laughs> it was a great point. Um, that, you know, it, it's, um, that why, is it so hard for any of you 
to access your true self. Like, why does it have to be so difficult? I mean, thank God we have dreams so you can access a little bit of it. But like, if it's part of you, why, why is, does the universe make it so hard to access yourself? And then so you take that from the 20th century and you throw all this new baggage on top of it. It's like, oh, wow, extra harder, harder than ever. So maybe here we talk about how the show yeah, is. Yeah, kind of I think it'd be interesting to yeah, delve into the show now and think about how it's structured, but also I think some of the comments you were just making, especially how, how you work together um, with the contributors and how the copy came together in particular, because every, every um, image you're seeing in the back, um, a lot of these are the book pages and the text, the copy is written by Doug, uh, Shimon and Hans Arik. And then the imagery, more often than not, is from one of the contributors to the exhibition. So, so yeah, we, it's, it's a deeply collaborative venture. And I think we're inspired by the fact that, you know, if you were to ask the question, who's the author behind the internet? There's no answer, right? And, and so, we firmly believe in a form of collective in intelligence that grows exponentially with individual intelligences. So it starts with the three of us writing the text. Then we send the text out, in this case to over 70 different uh, artists, filmmakers, musicians, photographers. And um, this time the brief was to look through what we'd written, but then send back uh, a portrait, a self-portrait, or a portrait of a crowd. Um, and then, in a sense, it's as though this um, amazing group are uh, a kind of human version of Google search. Um, but what you get back are, uh, it's a sort of surrealist Google search, because of course, artists um, and creative uh, individuals have extremely un um, unpredictable and unconventional ways of responding to questions like that. Yeah. And so what the, the project is, I mean, it's many things, but it's also a kind of uh, gallery of what defines contemporary portraiture today. And so you'll have everything from a very, cla almost like a classical uh, photographic self-portrait to vials of, D uh, vials of DNA matter, you know, uh, or graphs of pheromones and data uh, smell data um, and so the and then we work with our graphic designer Wayne Daly who also worked on the age of earthquakes he's our Quentin Fiore um, and then we sort of painstakingly go through um, matching these images with the text um, and so what you get is uh, experientially is it's a in a way a kind of new kind of graphic novel I think um, and uh, you know, you can, you can read the words and then look at the images, or you can look at the images first and read the words, or, or I, I think ultimately everybody reads it in their own way. And, um, but as, as we said earlier, it, it has to kind of, it, every page, every spread has to work within that 2.5 second time frame. Yeah. And that's the kind, that's the rule of the game that we set up. Well, I think another part of the rule was we had to create something that would make no sense to someone maybe 10 years before that. And then the part, part of the issue with that is that you write something, and especially in the last four, four or five years, like reality completely eclipses it. And so that kind of forced us to get our game on. So like what is really new and what's gonna date very quickly? Uh, so there are, there are 13 chapters in the book and actually the chapters are uh, almost taken verbatim from Eric Hobsbawm's book, but updated for the 20, to the 21st century. And so you move from, um, they range at the beginning from psychological int questions of kind of intimacy, uh, like emotional veracity, um, celebrity. Uh, and then as you move through the chapters, uh, particularly on the third floor, uh, the, there's a kind of scale shift. And then you're looking at questions uh, to do with the, ult the ultra wealthy as a form of extreme self, uh, the end of democracy, uh, like one of the, one of the uh, quintessences of democracy today is that it's being used 
to ultimately dismantle itself? That actually, in the last four or five years, is the one that shocked me the most, is the self-dismantlement of democracy yeah. and the pace and the ferocity of it. And it's, it's all over the world. It's not just the States or Brexit, it's like Turkey. It, you know. The democratically elected authoritarian leader. You know, that's the, it's one of the extreme, the extreme selves par excellence, I think, of the last 15 years. And like today, Boris Johnson, what he, he's declared an election. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe you can bring Victoria into the conversation now. So you yeah. are the contributors that was invited to participate in the project. And so Victoria has upstairs um, a print that's in the prelude section. So maybe we can start there and how you responded to the book. Yeah, so hello. <laughs> um, so the work that I have in the book is a, uh, it's a makeup wipe. And you will have seen some um, images of them on the slideshow. Um, the brightness on the images is a little bit high, um, so it's better if you go to the second floor and look um, at the print that's there. Um, but basically, these are works where I work in uh, mostly performance, film, and writing. And when I perform, I uh, play with drag and costuming, and after every performance, I take off my makeup with uh, a wet wipe and I do a print. Um, these can be looked at as like drawings or paintings or I mean I studied printmaking at the Royal College of Art so I do see them through a, a, a printmaking lens. They, they are mono prints. Um, but for me because working in performance is difficult it's very ephemeral. It happens and it goes away so it's incredibly useful for me to have um, these objects which act as an archive. Um, of my performance works. Um, but they also become performative images in themselves. They kind of retain something of the character that was performed on that occasion. Um, they become kind of a death mask of that particular embodiment. Um, and my work is a lot about kind of thinking about, um, you know, different kind of things that contribute to identity and how we perform them and how we can also kind of take them off. So for me also the act of embodying gender and identity and then removing it um, becomes an incredibly important part of my practice. Um, as I kind of collect more of them, it becomes like really clear, like how much kind of... Um, okay. Um, it becomes incredi incredibly clear, like uh, how much labor goes into the performance. So they also act as kind of like a document of uh, the kind of emotional and um, feminine labor that goes into performing um, gender, uh, especially for kind of feminine identifying people. Um, within the exhibition as well, I have two films on the third floor. Um, so maybe we can just touch on that to explain. So, so the, the book, I mean, many of you went up already, is also a support structure for the exhibition, which contains, I think there's 12 um, independent works. So, you know, through conversations that I was partly involved in as well, we discussed which works could kind of expand upon certain themes within each chapter and then present those as installations. Um, and so one of those is Victoria's. Yeah, so um, uh, I have two films in the show. They're both from a body of work called A View From Elsewhere, um, which was a body of work that I produced last year. It was a multimedia fantasy on the experience of desire, shame, um, identification and objectification. Um, the first work that you will see is called Illocutionary Utterances, um, and it's about language and speech acts in particular. Um, so I became very interested in speech acts, and uh, speech acts are things that basically you, 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 create, you enact something in the action of saying it. So for example, um, if you say, I'm sorry, you are enacting that apology. Or, I promise you such and such, you are creating that promise. Um, or, uh, I now pronounce you man and wife, you are then creating that, um, that pairing. You're speaking that into existence. So, I became very interested in how speech acts also relate to gender. Um, 
So, you know, the first example of that would be when um, a baby is born, even before a baby is born, and a doctor will say it's a boy or it's a girl. And this then sets up that child's life um, completely and creates a path for how that person will be treated for the rest of their lives um, and what they kind of are allowed to do, how they will dress. Um, so a very important part of my work is that I um, don't identify as a gender. I'm non-binary. Um, and you'll see in images um, of my work that I play a lot with drag and kind of very exaggerated embodiments of femininity. Um, for me, femininity does not necessarily have anything to do with womanhood, and I think it's very important to distance ideas of masculinity and femininity from manhood and womanhood, because these can be um, very kind of like violent um, presuppositions. Um, so, speech acts become incredibly important, especially for people who are trans, because, um, you know, by self-identifying, the act of self-identifying becomes a speech act. Um, and the work uh, is very personal to me, but I think, you know, a lot of my work is very personal, but I really firmly believe that, you know, um, the more personal, the more universal. Um, the work ends with a speech act, which is, I am not a woman. And this, for me, as somebody who is gender non-binary, is a speech act that I enact very often, um, because I move through the world and people identify me as a woman. Um, the imagery within the film is a close-up of myself in drag, of just my mouth, um, lip-syncing. So you have this very exaggerated um, uh, performance of speaking that does not have any kind of speech attached to it. That you also can't hear the actual soundtrack that is um, attached to the imagery. Um, and for me, this is also like playing with this frustration of like uh, often living in a world where some people are heard more than others. And within that, then some speech acts or some people's speech acts are more effective than others or are more valid than others. Um, the second work is called Tell Me Everything You Saw and What You Think It Means. Um, and this work has everything to do with looking and being looked at. Um, the title comes from uh, a line in Rear Window that Grace Kelly says to um, James Stewart. Um, and there's an irony in the title in that within Rear Window, Grace Kelly is the real object of the gaze. Um, so the image of the film is um, an image of me um, in drag reclining in a kind of very, uh, you could say like art traditional pose, um, a feminine body reclining in kind of like a lush um, context. Um, and it's an image that you're used to looking at and you're kind of taught or you know how to consume it. Um, and the text uh, is basically narrating your experience of looking at this image. Um, so I wrote the text from the perspective of somebody who not only um, knows what it feels like to be looked at in a specific way, especially for um, uh, in kind of like a feminine sexualized way, um, you know, on occasions that I did or didn't want it, um, as well as from the perspective of somebody who does look at um, images that way, especially images of femininity and, and feminine bodies that way. Um, and the experience of looking becomes complicated because while you're looking at this image of um, me, you are be be you're, you're, you're being made aware of how you are consuming an image and how there is kind of like an inherent violence in consuming images, especially gendered imagery, especially kind of like feminine images. Um, but this violence is kind of part of the eroticism. Um, it, uh, the image eventually goes away. Um, as you'll see, and you are left 
looking at a blank screen as the text continues. Um, and in this blank screen, you'll see your own reflection. So in the end, there is kind of a sense of like the image gaining autonomy and um, being confronted with the ways in which we consume images. Um, I think that, yeah, in my practice, looking at images is, uh, is, is completely central to it because I really believe that, you know, we change when we look at images. We live in an image-based culture. How, I, I can't remember what the number is, how many images we look at per day. But, you know, images change us and our relationship to images also changes over our lives, I think especially in terms of gendered imagery, but also raised imagery. Um, any kind of um, like identity category um, that you have, there is like an ideal version of that in images. And these ideal images become more and more extreme. Um, the more images that are produced, because we live in capitalism, and um, the more anxiety produced in the consumer based on that consumer's distance from the ideal image, the more likely they are to kind of spend money to become closer to that thing. I think that's a nice way to shift into thinking about some of the other works and the exhibition around, I mean, the exhibition essentially is about looking and about seeing looking. and ascribing identity, gender, other preconceptions. And then I think the most interesting kind of segue in the exhibition is also how machine learning is playing such a major role in so many of the works and how now, I think in Trevor's work, you know, the, the humans are no longer involved in that act of seeing and the machines are doing all of that labor, but based on like former kind of understandings of power and world structure. So we could talk well, about that. Hearing you, you know, talk, Victoria, makes me think, you know, this famous, um, like the foundation of uh, Western, you know, philosophy from the 17th century onward would be Descartes. Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Um, but now you could say, well, I am seen, therefore I am, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so, you know, what does, do you, do you even exist if you're not seen? Yeah. Uh, if, and, and by that, also by yourself, right? So that's why you'll see different forms of mirror I mean, there's a work by Sophia Almeria called Mirror Cookie upstairs. Um, and uh, Sophia's worked with Victoria a number of times. And, um, but uh, uh, in this work, it's, <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a portrait of another of an extraordinary Chinese-American uh, actress called Bei Ling. Uh, but it's a kind of uh, deeply moving confession of her own experience with um, forms of various forms of violence, um, but a lot of that violence has to do with how she's been looked at. She is a woman that is um, very looked at, but she is also somebody who's, you know, I, I, I follow her on Instagram, and uh, her entire persona is about being looked at. Um, so, you know, she definitely, she, she, that's what she wants. So, you know, I definitely think like, you know, there is a sense of like, I look, therefore I am, but definitely, I mean, for sure in my generation, there is a sense of kind of like, I am seen, therefore I am. Um, I think that like this kind of discussion around like social media websites is um, really important because there was kind of like, a, you know, the, the, the kind of the base of these social media websites, the kind of functions were different. You know, there was kind of, um, Facebook, which is about like the connections that you have with other people, um, how many friends you have, and you, uh, you know, you make a friend request and somebody accepts it or doesn't accept it, and then you have that connection. Um, whereas Instagram, which has kind of completely taken over um, Facebook, um, you know, most people, most people I know don't really use Facebook at all anymore. Um, and the kind of Instagram has also kind of uh, created functions to completely supersede Facebook. Um, you know, it didn't used to have messaging. Um, 
And the kind of the function of Instagram is not to have connections or to have friends. It's to kind of create um, almost like a brand image of yourself and kind of put it out. And there's how many likes you get. And you follow people, and they don't have to follow you back. So it becomes very much about like a creating yourself as a product to be consumed. And then, as, as November uh, alluded to, <clears throat> I mean, we think of these, sometimes I think we miss conceive these images uh, using uh, kind of old definitions of images, you know. So even if you think, I mean, if you think about what a painting was or what a photograph was, I mean, they were ultimately uh, constellations of matter and of light. Um, but Trevor Paglin, whose film you'll see on the third floor called, it's called Behold These Glo Glorious Times, reminds us that um, most, uh, most of the images produced today and they're in the billions, if not trillions, are made by machines for machines. And uh, in a really important essay called it, he, called, he refers to these as invisible images. And he says that, you know, the, what happens when an image becomes a packet of data is it's no longer merely aesthetic, uh, it becomes operational. And so again, this, this is the, the kind of basic unit then of, of a data capitalist uh, economy and a data capitalist power system, because those images are not merely visual. They're not there. They happen to be visual because, in a way, they ingratiate our kind of narcissism or our desire to want to look at something. But their real use value is something else. It's surveillance, it's credit scoring, uh, it's um, you know, policing, it's, it's data, it's capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this, ha this is the shift, this is, a, this is a profound shift of power. And it's interesting that this shift of power happens when an image becomes invisible to us, you know. And, um, but you could argue there's a paradox here because as, as these images technically become invisible, you know, we're becoming more visible or we're participating or performing in greater levels of visibility to each other and ourselves, you know. So, um, so these are so you, this question of looking, I think, and seeing, and and uh, and the illusion of of uh, uh, of this, uh, you'll see again and again and again throughout a number of works. Farah Al Qasimi, who's from uh, the Emirates, uh, who who sort of maps spaces of also of f female beautification but also of, uh, uh, of shopping, uh, the kind of space of desire of shopping. Um, Sarah Swinar's film at upstairs um, on floor two called Red Film, which is part of a trilogy on color and desire, and also how color is weaponized by cosmetics companies, but also think about rose gold. Do you remember a few years ago, Apple came out with rose gold and that became the, the color to get, but it was aimed really specifically, predominantly at a female market. Yeah. Um, and so this kind of history of color and the weaponization of color, particularly within like gender, gendered uh, uh, commercial environments. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's this whole question of looking. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you, Victor, if you could tell us a little bit about the performance that you're planning here, because maybe some of our guests will come back to see that. Yeah, please do. Um, so on November 28th, uh, I will return to Toronto to do a performance here. Um, it's uh, called, If I Had the Words to Tell You, We Wouldn't Be Here Now. Um, and it's uh, also about language. Um, it's about the kind of shortcomings of language, really, um, and a kind of impossibility. Um, that I think I've been feeling more and more, um, especially recently, as kind of things become more and more um, polarized. Um, it's about a kind of difficulty of expressing emotion with language. Um, it's also about um, the difficulty of expressing any thought that's really truly um, kind of anti-capitalist or feminist or post-colonial. Um, where, I mean, and I'm speaking specifically about um, English in this um, context, but I think it applies to many languages as well, um, where the English language was, um, you know, constructed and developed and exists in its kind of current 
um, state as something that was created through histories of power, through histories of colonialism and capitalism and patriarchy. Um, so how can you express a thought that is not kind of just reifying those um, structures of power? Um, so the performance itself is staged as a duet with an instrumentalist. Um, and I've performed it twice already. There have been two previous iterations. Um, the first one was in Taipei with a pipa player. Um, a pipa is a Chinese lute. It's a very lyrical um, instrument. And the second time was, uh, uh, that was at Chiwen Gallery. Um, the second time was at the Venice Biennale with a, a Baroque flautist called Matteo Gemelo. Um, and this time will be with a percussionist called Nikki Joshi. Uh, and the reason that I use a different instrument every time is because um, you know, music, of course, is its own language. Um, and every instrument will bring its own, um, its own emotion, its own kind of cultural baggage with it, its own um, like expressive qualities. Um, so often in the performance, there will be words which are omitted um, because I think that there is like a real difficulty in naming. Um, and language is like really, um, you know, essentially it's a process of, of naming. Um, so naming for me is something that's like, it, it's, it's, it, it, it can be empowering, of course, like it's empowering to define yourself. Um, but also once you have defined yourself, you have created delineation around yourself that you then have to consciously step out of. There becomes a thing that you have to transgress. Um, so, in place of many names in the performance, um, I asked the instrumentalist to um, substitute either a few notes or a musical sentence um, so that there can be kind of like more of a sense of um, both emotion but also kind of a freedom to be able to project um, what, whatever you want on it and that will be different for everybody. Um, so just thinking, it's interesting to talk about language in this way, and yet the exhibition is, like, contains a lot of language. And I just wanted Doug specifically and Shimon could speak a little bit about the editing process around the, the copy, because I mean, there must be so many expressions when you're writing things that are so succinct and so like, to the point. I, I, I think that a lot of the text in the book is about compression. And how much can you compress into not even a sentence? like even two words or whatever, and, and does that compression, would that, if that had made sense to someone 10 years ago, like, out of here. Uh, and we kept on trying to, again, isolate, what are these new sensations, perceptions, realizations we're having inside our heads collectively, it's not just individually. So on that level, you know, the shorter the better. Uh, and then we have some, quotes thrown in there and a few longer pieces, but basically, I mean, I, I was very ambivalent about having a show that's largely panels. It's like, oh, it feels like a very worthy show you might have gone to in a grade 11 field trip or something. And so how can you make that experience inside your head when you read a word more than just like scanning it? That it's like a little flower that blossoms and then you go off to the next one. Um, I mean, what would the inside of our heads be like any of us if we didn't have language, if you were just an animal and you just, you live in the present tense and you, it's all about food and tactility and noises, but not language. So in as much as language can be reduced to that level, that's as far as we wanted to get it, like really boiled down. And then there's, then there's, there's also the question of the evolution of language. So you'll, you know, if you, if you walk through, you will have walked over an emoji hole. There are a number of these through, throughout the building. They're embedded in, often in the, the title of the show on the on vinyl on the door. Uh, and you'll see on both of the floors uh, a new uh, wallpaper that's been um, designed by an artist called Yuri Patterson. And he's taken the uh, eye emojis from the mage, major social media platforms across different um, uh, uh, device, uh, device makes, and then using uh, an AI uh, 
content fill algorithm has created this bewildering, mesmerizing, borderline creepy pattern um, that, uh, that, you know, talks, uh, is, is simultaneously cute and also George Orwell's 1984, you know, and reminds us that the, uh, the fruition of 20th century dystopia um, is, doesn't look like how Orwell imagined it. It looks like a string of cute emojis mm -hmm. that we send to each other. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, this is, I mean, one thing I noticed, uh, so soon after the uh, American election in 2016, <clears throat> there's been, you know, this kind of rash to um, make television adaptations of famous dystopian novels. So, Handmaid's Tale, but also Philip K. Dick's that Man in the High Castle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think that the reason that happened was that um, there's something quaint about dystopias that look like dystopias. I mean, we all know we're living in dystopia, but it doesn't look like, you know, Margaret Atwood's version, or it doesn't look like Orwell's version. So we can now somehow process that as culture and enjoy it. But in a way, the, the, the dystopia that we're living in is much more sinister because it doesn't look like that. In fact, it doesn't look like dystopia at all most of the time. Well, uh, okay, Th this touches on something I was speaking about earlier with uh, some friends who came to the show. Uh, and how it is that in 2019, the only person or group of people that you're allowed to like, bash like a pinata as much as you want are optimists and and then I got to thinking well you know optimists never get laid <laughs> and that it's really easy to be negative and I was born in 61 and then in the 70s I was taught that the future which then was the year 2000 was going to be uh, no, no fresh water all entirely polluted soil and green uh, no energy, and then here we are. It's kind of fantastic, actually. This is not what uh, we are supposed to be having in 2019. And that a lot of what we do in our culture, and I'm very aware of this, is we psych ourselves out, or we take a small part of everything to represent the massive part of everything else. And uh, we... I was reading The Guardian online about three or four weeks ago, and in the bottom of the science section, it's not even on the front page, it's like, uh, ozone hole to be completely fixed by 2024, which is one Olympics away. And I got to thinking, well, I remember not being able to sleep at night because of this thing called acid rain. And I remember like on TV, it would rain on the Colosseum in Rhone, and you could like, the stone would sizzle and in Germany, you had the Waldsterben of the dying forests. So, you know, we fixed acid rain, we fixed uh, the ozone hole, and we'll probably fix all this. But boy, trying to get some mileage out of that, like, <laughs> like whereas, you know, anyone out there who just like, I'm going to be negative. And the thing about being negative is that you give the impression of intelligence without actually having to be intelligent or say anything intelligent, just like, watch out for data raping. It's like, my God, that, you already got data raped ages ago. I mean, uh, that there is hope in all of this. And I, I don't want people to go through the floor and like, oh my God, we're completely, we're, we're screwed. There, there is actual hope at the end of all this. And it's not just like Disney feel good. It's that we have actually fixed very large planetary problems before and we can fix this. Uh, how we fix political polarization. I don't know. <laughs> no one knows how that's going to happen. Well, you kind of, I mean, the, the show concludes with David Bowie, so maybe we can conclude the talk by just mentioning the relevance of David Bowie and the fact that his death well, so marks. The last chapter is called Towards the End. Um, also, just a side note, we don't unfortunately have time to go through every single work, but we've hopefully you've seen images here and you'll go and uh, experience them. Uh, Satoshi Fujiwara's crowd landscape. 
uh, Agnieszka Kurant's extraordinary AAI termite mounds and man many other things. Um, and Dennis Cavillman's uh, wonderful piece, which is here at the entrance, which is there for you to in interact with. But actually that is a kind of partner piece with uh, what is technically the last uh, moment in the show up on floor three, which is a pairing of two seemingly dissimilar uh, artifacts on the on the one hand, uh, it's a, 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 is it a resin cast? Uh, fiberglass. Fiberglass cast of David Bowie's face, which had been sourced back in 2014 from a BBC makeup artist. Yeah, is, yeah. for another project completely. For another project completely. Yeah. Um, but was now, since Bowie died in January 2016, has uh, this kind of extraordinary haunting quality to it, but well, uh, uh, go one notch back. Uh, it is a show that we, uh, we did in uh, the Vit the Vit Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam, and that Villa Stuck in Munich is we had uh, the the Bowie life mask death mask uh, paired with a small truism from Jenny Holzer, which said that in a dream you saw a way to survive and you were full of joy which I think taps into optimism. But then when we were installing that piece, and you were there when we were installing it, and David Bowie was alive at that point, and we sort of like went, ha ha, like rift on like Damien and her shark, and uh, the impossibility in the mind of David, body, David Bowie being dead and alive with someone living. And then he died in the last week of the show, and like, like oh, it was kind of this weird, chilling transition in terms of the artifact. But then that was the year that everything went to crap. Remember that? Well, listen, yeah. I, was on a, I was in a hotel on the 36th floor in Dubai. I heard David Bowie died. And you were the first person I called. And we basically broke down on the phone together. Oh, yeah. and, it was, and, um, and it was strange. I mean, it was the end of January 2016. But we firmly believe that the shit show hologram that we're now inhabiting started the very moment that Bowie breathed his last breath. That's where, yeah, that's where history broke. That's where history yeah, broke. Yeah. And we paired it upstairs with, um, with a, a piece which is actually not art. Um, it's, a, it's a demonstration of a piece of technology by a technology company called NVIDIA and a number of its researchers. Um, and Doug, you, li you like this piece very much. Maybe oh, you could describe it. It's like it this year's The Clock. It's uh, the 10,000 celebrities, male, female. 30,000. 30,000. 30, okay. um, and then ha they, they morph in and out of each other, but at no point they've designed it so you never have the complete celebrity. So like, oh, there's Jodie Foster up above, and suddenly it's Ben Affleck's, what's, and then, and then you recognize one celebrity, but it's just long enough, the two and a half second thing I think you're talking yeah. about, where you can never actually store a permanent memory inside your brain. It's just this endless flow of faces which look and feel famous, but they're not. But what is fame and what's celebrity and what does it mean to be important or big or a number or whatever in 2019? It's very compelling viewing. And then you go from there to the mask, it's like, whoop. It's like, were frozen in a most chilling manner. Yeah. Thank you. I think, so we want to try something a bit different. Well, Shimon is intrigued to try and, um, rather than ask for questions from the audience, to see if we can ask a few questions to so the there audience. Are, there, are, there are a number of questions in the book and in the show, and we would like to test them out on you. Um, so the first question, uh, so, if your answer is yes, please put your hand up. Um, and then if your answer is no, you'll put your hand up afterwards. So, do you still feel like an individual? Yes, hands up. No, please, hands up. Ah. Rui, uh, Daniel, why? Because who gives a shit about what I think? <laughs> <laughs> The perfect meta, an meta answer. Who, who else didn't feel like an individual? Agnieszka. You don't? No, because I think that we... Um, uh, actually, Yuval Harari had this uh, uh, notion 
notion that he coined it would be paying hackable animals. And I think that this is very, uh, uh, I think that we're being hacked from both uh, with uh, inside and outside. We're being hacked by algorithms from the outside, but we're being hacked by uh, our microbiomes from the inside. So the, something that defines us as individuals, which is uh, you know, like free will and uh, our ability to make decisions uh, as individuals, Completely dismantled. Okay, uh, you just maybe changed my mind. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer feeling um, an individual. <laughs> <laughs> you take it. So if you want to go to the microphone okay. for the next round, so we'll do it back from here. So next question. Um, if you could get a perfect clone of yourself, would you? Yes, hands up please. Wow. Ah. And no? Uh, that uh, shocks me. Wow, that I'm really <laughs> shocks me. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Well, maybe the next sentence will, will complicate it. Well, the, the rest of it doesn't even work. So it was like three people. I know. It was three people. Why does that Because it would be nice to have lots of more me in the world. <laughs> I think it would be obvious. You must believe in the individual. Well, yes. Thank you. So, Well, no. I mean, I mean, I don't even know. Like, would it be gay or straight? Would it? I. Who knows what's nature and what's nurture? And it would be a really wonderful chance to figure out. You know, well, what if? Why is a clone? Then what if? Well, well, I mean, is a is a clone? In, okay. Like oh my God! You know what you actually did? You guys just as a group dissed identical twins. You're like, who here would like to have an identical twin? Everyone's like, yay. But you have a clone, and everyone's like, no. no. So, okay. <laughs> what's, the, what's the twist on that? Well, the, the, the follow on is if so, would, would your clone come first in your will? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. What if you didn't like your clone? Would you have to get divorced from, the, from it in some way? <laughs> oh, God, that's like, what if he turns out to be like my asshole brother or something? <laughs> Divorce, yeah, I, that, that would have to be part of the clone law. And if your clone became much more famous than you, would you be annoyed? Oh God, yes. <laughs> well, that's my biggest nightmare. Like, like, okay, like, okay. <laughs> like, 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 would, would you smother your clone with a scarf at like a party in Hollywood because they got more attention than you? <laughs> I don't, this, is, this is all too theoretical. <laughs> <laughs> Let's like um, we have microphones out there. Are there people in the audience yeah, who would like to ask a question? Well, that says, does your clone have an independent existence from you? No, it would have one of those electrical dog bracelets around its thing. <laughs> so every time it did anything to displease me, it would experience pain. Well, I don't. I just life is such a crapshoot. There's so many coincidences and you know there's there was a storm or you had an accident and who am I I mean I'm realizing that time's running out and I'm only gonna know one tiny little bit of what it is to be alive and to operate in the world and have agency and maybe if there was a clone around at least you could see like another way it could have turned out for better or for worse or something so I mean I, I guess I'm using clones as a metaphor for how time goes by so quickly and we have so little self-knowledge, it just scares the crap out of me, so. Any other questions, your turn. I'm just wondering if, um, if we're really living in the age of the image and mm. I'm wondering if, it's gonna sound weird because I actually think what you've done is really brilliant, but do you think you're doing a disservice to language by having reduced everything to that? I think we are propelling language like further um, and I would like to thank Wayne for this his incredible use of emojis etc which like it or not are part of the language now and will be uh, even more so language is all about usage um, the OED has that one the word of the year which they were on a really good like it was like um, selfie uh, you, you remember, um, what were other ones? Well, they, well they, unfriend. The, the laughing, crying emoji. And then, was word of the and then unfriend. And then they had this weird one called. They had vape. 
youth quake or oh, yeah, you know, that's that's so um, I think there's like over half a million words in the English language and it's only gonna get weirder and richer and I think I'm really lucky if nothing else English is my native tongue I went to the dentist a year ago and he put too much freezing in and I got lockjaw which I'd never had before and so you're basically eating crackers and Velveeta or uh, cheese slices and I wrote to a friend in Belgium and said well, I got, got lockjaw and he's like Oh, you English, you always have a word for everything. <laughs> and so I'd rather have the word for everything and then keep on making new words. Yeah. This is, so it's a service, not a disservice. I want to hear your answer to this. Probably, yeah. I really believe that, like, my use of um, Instagram and just kind of like, you know, infinite scroll and, you know, how often everything is updated, it, it changes the way your brain works. Um, it changes the way you interact with other people and interact with the world. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the thing about human brains is that they're so plastic, and humans are also the only animals which completely construct the environment in which the brain shapes and grows. So, you know, the kind of uh, infrastructure that we create to operate in changes the way that our minds work. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, how old were you when you got your first phone? When I got my first... Phone. Phone? Yeah. Um, I was in grade eight, so I was 13. So was it, was it uh, what kind of freedom, what, what, like, uh, got, how did that feel in your head? How did that feel in my head? Yeah. Like emancipation or? No, not, not really. It was under like a really weird circumstance. Like I have quite conservative parents and I actually had a stalker when I was 13. So they got me this phone so that I could contact them at all times. So it wasn't really like an emancipatory thing. Oh. Talking about a question backfiring. Oh my, okay. Close to mine. Okay. I have a question. Uh, so you asked an interesting question of your students. Um, they picked the opposite of you. Now, asking you the same question, using that mural, using any materials, how would you depict the opposite of you in that school? Okay. Well, I think that gets back to the clone. I mean, what if the clone was the opposite of me? Uh, opposite ideologically, emotionally. Um, uh, maybe that's where the darkness is. It, it's uh, the, the thing that is the opposite of you is the thing that most reflects you or um, what am I saying here? That you know, I, I, the enemy within um, Oh God, I'm not, I'm not being very good here, I'm sorry. It's the one question I've actually never come up with an answer for. But, but I do think, like, there's an expression I heard last year, like, nice people are not necessarily good people. And, and we all know people are sugar and spice, but they're not very nice. And what if, you know, that's the, my clone? Or, I don't know, what if one day my data stream becomes sentient and then that becomes... Then it turns on me, then it really is the opposite. There's so many ways that could go. That's why I love science fiction. To be There's honest. an episode of Black Mirror. Black Mirror is great. That, yeah, that yeah. does that, yeah. So. Where they have kind of like a brain clone, and then it becomes the people's uh, kind of secretary. Mm -hmm. you know, if I was the singularity, the first thing I'd do is copy myself and make a duality. And then so I had someone to talk with. And then, and then they'd just say, forget people altogether, and let's just. Anyhow, we're getting silly. Okay. Take one more question. And yep. First of all, thank you for a very thought-provoking show. Um, oh. And as I went through it, much too quickly because of lack of time, but I will come back. Uh, I thought, oh, this is depressing. And then, of course, I ran into you, and you say, well, optimism and this and that. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, so this is depressing, but I'm actually not depressed. And so that as I'm listening to you life. talk, it's all about language and mm. words. 
and it's very cerebral. And so what I'm wondering is, have we numbed ourselves? Where's the emotion? We look, you know, this, the case of this uh, young man, the 14-year-old, who was fed drugs and uh, videotaped on social media, and no one thought it was real, really. Only one person called in. So what has happened to reality, and where are our emotions in all of this? Why are we not more angry well. at what's happening in the world? And I, I'm, I'm finding this a little bit flattered. Yeah. I, I think this show is largely about uh, isolating and locating new modes of collective thinking across the species. For example, uh, you know, and, 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 hang on, I need to answer this the way I answer it. Um, that you were to tell someone from 20 years ago that in 20 years you'll be able to have the answer to any question you ever wanted to ask, free, anywhere on the planet, without judgment or anything. And would not be like the golden age of humanity. And of course, we just get bored very quickly. And so um, knowing everything turns out to be slightly boring, which comes from the last book. And then you had the Grexit situation, which is spelled out sort of in painful, you know, a painful manner, the difference between uh, like doing nothing, la dolce far niente, versus having nothing to do and the existential crisis of, uh, I mean, I, I think we're obviously we're artists. We all get angry. We have emotions, whatever. And for this show here, we had to focus it in on new modes of thinking or new ways that we made the technology and then it's made us. And again, ideology rarely keeps pace with technology. And that, you know, we're introducing astonishing new technologies almost annually into our life. Uh, and we actually have to give ourselves a little golf clap for having dealt with it reasonably well. I mean, who knows what's coming down the pipe for 2020? You know, I'm sure Silicon Valley will give us some weird new thing. Um, I want to end with just one thing here. Um, so, on with Shimon, I did it. I punked him, and I sent uh, an email saying, "Oh my God, you won't believe it! That Google is now allowing you to buy anonymity." for 1995 a month with a fake link that went off to somewhere else. And I imagine you read that and you're like, and then you thought, oh, he's just bullshitting me. But where did your brain go for that 30 seconds when you thought, oh my gosh, you could actually buy privacy back? Uh, it seemed uh, unbelievably implausible that Google would suddenly have this um, moral uh, change of kind of compass. Um, and uh, I wanted to believe it, I did believe it, but at the back of my mind, I also couldn't believe it. Okay. Um, because, uh, I mean, you asked the question about emotions. I mean, the, the difficult thing now is that our emotions are being engineered. Um, you know, some of the brightest mathematicians in the world are using their collective intelligence to effectively engineer emotions. You know, in the past, the great engineers would build cathedrals and, and, and you know, amazing suspension bridges. And now it's, it's, it's engineering our emotions. Manipulating people. Yeah. And, and this kind of planetary oil spill that we talked about in 2016 now we know, I mean, there isn't a corner of the, pla of the planet where this hasn't gone into. And so, if anything, I think we're more emotional than we've ever been. Yeah. Um, but, but we're not necessarily the authors of that emotion. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the problems of our kind of political space is that it's, it's become so emotionally extreme. Okay. Um, and, and so, if anything, we need to... Uh, we almost need to be less emotional <laughs> than, we've, than, than we're somehow being um, made to be, yeah. I think. And, and you can always use Bing. Uh, you could always use Bing, okay. which is like not being on the internet okay. ever. So, um, merch? Merch. With that, talk about acquisitions. 
Uh, merch is a very important part of this project, and there may be more merch to come. Uh, but the merch that exists right now, well, we have The Age of Earthquakes, the first book. Um, I think there are a number of copies in the shop if you'd like to buy them, and I think everyone would be very willing to sign those copies. Um, and then Shimon and uh, Wayne also designed two T-shirts um, with some of the copy from that you've seen behind us. Um, and something that might be helpful is, um, I always forget what it's called. Yeah, what's, what are these? Webcam things cover. Webcam, I don't have one. But if you cover your webcam with a little bit of sticky tape like a lot of people do, you can now buy a webcam camera hider designed by uh, Shimon and Wayne. So, so merch that, on the right, so special merch, price. Wine, Please food. be branded. Are the galleries open? The galleries are open, but I think only till nine, but we have the opening tomorrow night as well from six, if any, would you, any of you would like to join us. We also have a talk on Thursday, which I think is sold out, if people want to sneak in. Um, and uh, Agnesha, Agnieszka Curant, who uh, voiced a couple of opinions during the conversation, will be on the, on the stage. And a number of other public programs throughout the, uh, the course of the next three months, including Victoria Sin and Trevor Paglin. So lots to come. Um, and with that, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.